we're in a new series. It's called A Life Laid Down. And part of that series, we really want all of you to be praying with us for the church globally, especially for the persecuted church. So we've asked all life groups if you would join us praying for the persecuted church globally. And we have a resource that we would love for you to grab if you haven't already got one. It's called the World Watch List. It's put out by Open Doors Ministries. And it just gives a list of the 50 most persecuted countries uh, for Christians in the world and how we could effectively be praying for those churches in those countries. You can pick up the book. It's just called the World Watch List at the Info Center. Uh, So if you're in a life group, or even if you're not and you want to be praying with us, please grab one um, at the info center today before you go home. As we said, we're already, uh, we're a couple weeks into our new series. It's called A Life Laid Down. Before we get into the word this morning, could you join me as we pray uh, to and prepare our hearts to receive the word. As we've begun to do, could you pray with with your neighbor, however you're comfortable, if you want to put a hand on their shoulder or grab their hand or whatever you're comfortable with. We're going to pray both for ourselves and for our neighbor as we prepare to receive this morning. So Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence that's here in our midst. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us and convicts us. We thank you for your word that's sharper than a double-edged sword, able to teach us and transform our lives. So we ask that you would come and you would do that exact thing this morning. Would you renew our our minds? Would you transform our hearts? God, even in uh, places where we're stuck or hard places, God, would you pierce through by your Holy Spirit? Thank you that you're already here and you already have something that you want to accomplish this morning. So I ask that you would just give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is. And Father, I pray for myself, even as I deliver your word this morning, God, that it would be anointed by you, that I wouldn't say a single thing that's not of your spirit, God, but the things that you want us to hear, God, would you illuminate them to us. So prepare us. And we thank you and we praise you that you are not absent, but that you are here and you're active in our life. We give you permission, Holy Spirit, have your will, have your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think one of the most awesome blessings and perhaps one of the most harmful curses in our culture today is that we have been, we've bought into this idea in our culture, in our society, I think even in our personal lives, we've bought into this idea that I already have everything that I'm, I need. I'm fine, just the way I am. And if I don't already have it, I certainly can get it in a matter of minutes. It's no big deal. We love quick. Who loves things to be done as fast as possible? We love quick. We chase after convenience, and we worship individualism. It's all about what I want, when I want it, and how I want it done. No one is going to tell me any different. I've already got things sorted out. No one can tell me. If I'm missing something in my life, you don't get to tell me if I need to fix something or correct something or I need to improve. I'm fine just the way I am. And if I'm not, I'm going to sort it out real quick. We have awesome things like Amazon Prime shipping. Who doesn't love it? They don't love it. They're turning me off right now. The The lighting people do not love Amazon Prime shipping. I love Amazon Prime shipping. I have heard that in some major American cities, you actually can get free one-hour shipping. How unreal is that? Amazon Prime shipping. We do the same thing with the things that we watch. You don't have to watch commercials anymore if you don't want to. You can just stream what you want to watch, when you want to watch it, and you don't like that anymore. You just flip it to something else. It, it, uh, quickness and convenience also have infiltrated their ways even to the things that we eat. Family meals are advertised now and chosen based on how quick you can make it. Not based on how nutritious it's going to be or how good it is for your family, just how fast it's going to be. You can get this done in 20 minutes or less. We know what we want and we know we can get it right now. It can be a blessing, but it also can be a curse. Because in our society, we've been convinced time and time and time and time again, that we already have everything at our disposal. I don't need anything else. And so we become apathetic and we become comfortable with only the things that we can see and smell and touch and feel. That's all I need. 
That's it. We've bought into this idea that I'm a pretty good person just the way I am. And that's all I need to be. I just need to be a pretty good person. I just need to be kind to the people around me. I just need to be fair and equitable. And I need to be fair and equitable the way that my boss tells me to or society is telling me to be fair and equitable. I've got it all made. Even when the going gets tough in our lives, we've bought into this absurdity that somehow we have it within ourselves to solve all of the problems we're going to face. And we do it in the most convenient, simple ways possible. Work is too stressful? Just take a vacation. You, your day felt too long? Just have a drink. Your wife's nagging you? Just go out with the boys. Your kids aren't doing well at school? Just hire a tutor or scream at their teacher. Your family is sick? Just hustle to the doctor. You're overweight? Try the newest fad medication. Your friends are far from God? Just be nice to them. Maybe slip them an alpha invitation. Your, friend, your kids are struggling? They don't know God. Just send them to youth group and your job's done. It's 2024. You want to get closer to God. Order a devotional on Amazon Prime and then just flip through it and leave it on your coffee table. It's what we do. We've convinced ourselves that we already have it in our own hands, all the tools that we need to accomplish what God wants us to do. But what we're learning in this series is that we can't actually be disciples of Jesus Christ so long as we remain holding the tools that we think we need in our own hands. So long as we're doing things the way we think we should be doing them. So long as we're only pursuing the things that we feel like we should be pursuing right now, we can't call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Instead, we have to live lives that are laid down. We have to live lives that are quite literally like the clay in a potter's hand, where he gets to mold us and shape us and make us look how he wants us to look. We have to live lives in which we deny ourselves each and every day, and we take up our cross, which means we die to ourselves and we're raised to new life in Christ. And this new life is a life that is led by, dictated by, guided by, and empowered by God. And unless you're living a life laid down, unless you're living a life of what seems like radical, immediate obedience before God, we're just fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves to think that we can live life our own way, according to our own motives, clinging only to the things that are important to us and somehow still hold the things of God. It doesn't work that way. If you want access to the things of God... If you want to live in the power, the peace, the purpose of God Almighty, you need to live a life laid down. You need to live a life of supernatural surrender and radical obedience. This past Wednesday at our prayer meeting, if you don't come, I want to encourage you, please come and pray with us on Wednesday. It's always a good time. We, have, we worship together. We pray for the church and for our community. It's always a great time. We'd love to have you. And this past Wednesday, God gave me three quite vivid pictures while we were in prayer. And I have permission from the Holy Spirit just to share one of them with you today. And the thing that was quite um, awesome on Wednesday is typically God will speak to me like from a verse or give me a picture for something and I'll ask him, God, what do you want me to do with this? Or what does this mean? Or where do you want me to go? And I wait on the Holy Spirit to direct me. But the incredible thing on Wednesday was just one thing after the other. He just told me this verse and gave me this picture and then clarified it with this. It was quite awesome. And so the, the picture that I want to share with you this morning that God gave me on Wednesday, I was just asking him, God, teach us Teach me, like, what to pray. Where are we going? What are we doing? What are you up to? And he brought my attention to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 is a quote from the prophet Joel. And this is what Acts 2, 17 says. It says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will will dream dreams. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. And immediately, God gave me this picture of a great group of believers, maybe hundreds or thousands of us, and we were all walking forward together. 
And our arms were just full with all this stuff. Like literally we were fumbling with stuff. All these very useful things. All the kind of things that you need. Uh, that, you know, like uh, we had buckets and shovels and we had hammers and all these tools in our hands. And our, we were walking forward in unison and our arms were so full with all these tools. And then I heard God say, the hour is late. Quickly. Drop what's in your hands so that I might pour out my spirit and give you the tools that you need for this new hour. You see, the things that God wants to give us are not the things that we're holding. God's up to something new. And we're fumbling with all these tools of the world, but God wants to pour out his spirit fresh for this hour. And then he brought my attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, where it says, For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. The tools you're holding are not necessarily the tools God is asking you to use. On the contrary, the weapons that God gives us have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience. When? Once your obedience is complete. God is looking for an obedient church. He's looking for people who are living lives laid down. In the picture, all three of them that God gave me, they were all saying the same thing. They all began with the sense of the hour is late. In this one, drop what's in your hands in order that God could pour out his spirit and give you the tools that you actually need for this season. The hour is late. And God is calling his church to a new season. He's calling his church to a season in which our weapons are both crafted and wielded in the spirit. He's calling his church to wake up and to be revived in such a way that she might actually grab hold of what he has sent out for us. Because God will not be mocked. He is not slow in the manner that we consider him to be slow. He is simply patient with us in order that we might win some. He's patient. For now, because there are souls to be won, because there is ground to be taken, because there is healing to be obtained, there's wholeness and restoration to be laid hold of. But so long as we cling to the things of this world, so long as we are white-knuckled, grasping the things that we think are important, you're going to miss out on what God is asking you to do. We have to live lives that are laid down. It's the high cost of calling ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. If you're going to say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm going to follow his ways, it means it doesn't matter the cost. I'll die to myself. I'll give up anything in order that I might see his kingdom come in my midst. Church, are you hungry for that? Okay, I'll ask you again. Are you hungry for that? Or not? And the crazy thing is that we say we're hungry for it, but we don't pursue it in the way that we would pursue, pursue food if we were actually hungry. We don't stop what we're doing to partake in what God has prepared. I mean, what would you do if you were busy and the dinner bell rang? In my house, it doesn't matter what my kids are doing. If they're hungry, they could be playing video games, doing crafts. It doesn't matter. You say dinner's ready. They all come running to the table. And the crazy thing is that we smell that God is up to something new, but we're not turning our attention to the direction in which the fragrance is wafting. We know he's up to something, but we're busy doing our own thing that we're not paying attention. But he's up to something new. One great theologian says this, if you don't feel a strong desire for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you have drunk so deeply and are now satisfied. 
Instead, it's because you've nibbled so long at the table of the world that your soul is stuffed with small things and you have no room for the great. We've settled far too long for the cheap imitations of the real thing. We've settled far too long for what the world has to offer that we don't bother chasing the things of God anymore. We're not hungry for them. We're fine, just the way we are. And if we're not, we'll sort it out for ourselves. I'll ask somebody about it. I'll read the next great book Oprah recommends. I'll listen to the podcast my boss just told me about. And if you find yourself not hungry for God, it's not because you've got so much of him. You'll never have enough of him. Those who hunger and thirst for God, you'll never reach the end of him. You will never consume enough of him. You'll never know him enough. You'll never experience so much of him that you have now reached the end. So if you find yourself hungry no longer, it's not because you feasted on the Lord. It's because you're settling for scraps. But the hour's late. And there is too much on the line for us to not be chasing the things of God. Our world is in far too deep for the people of God to remain satisfied with scraps. We are too far along in what God is doing in the world and what he is calling his church to accomplish that we cannot remain distracted with ourselves one moment longer. There are souls still to be saved, one of which might be your friend or family member. And there are lives still to be transformed, one of which might actually be your own. And so we have to live a life laid down. We have to be willing to give up what we think we need in order of picking up what God knows we need. We have to set aside the tools that we wish we could fight with and pick up the tried and true tools of the kingdom of God. Because all the battles that you're facing the challenging ones and the not-so-challenging ones, and all of the battles that are still yet to come our way are not at all as they appear. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, we're implored by the Apostle Paul to don the armor of God. Why would he ask us to do that? He asks us to do that right here in Ephesians. It says, for your struggles not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Your battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not what it looks like, and you're not going to win it the way you think you're going to win it. And all of this reminds me of a remarkable woman in Scripture and one of the greatest weapons that we have in our God-given arsenal. It reminds me of this woman who was elevated to a very important place, and as soon as she arrived there, she realized that yet again, the people of God were in too deep. That just like today, for her, the hour was late. That just like today, their enemy was at the doorstep, and there was something that needed to be done. And this woman recognized, although she lived in the natural and she had things that she had to accomplish, that was not where her victory would be secured. I'm talking about Esther, the peasant queen. I'm talking about Esther, the unworthy one who was elevated to such a place for such a time. It's Esther the one to whom we all can relate because we too have been brought to such a place for such a time if we would only listen to the voice of God, if we would only respond in radical obedience, then we too would see the hand of God at work in our midst. If you're not familiar with the story of Esther, it takes place while the Jews are exiled in the Persian Empire. Although in the Bible, you're going to find Esther immediately after the book of Nehemiah. 
the events in the book of Esther actually occur about 30 years before the events in the book of Nehemiah. And the story opens with the queen of Persia kind of ticking off the king, not doing what he asked her to do. And so King Xerxes, the king of Persia, just disposes of his wife and begins a hunt for a new queen. Esther, this Jewish girl exiled in the Persian Empire, becomes one of the candidates. And King Xerxes is so enraptured and pleased with Esther that he chooses her, again, a Jewish girl, to be his new queen. And as soon as Esther becomes queen, one of the king's advisors devises a plot condemning all Jewish people to death. What a place to find herself. Esther's people, all of them now are to be put to death. What was she to do? How would she respond? Certainly the hour was late and the clock was ticking. Well, certainly she could have devised a plan. She could have asked one of her assistants or one of her slaves, go into the palace and figure out what's actually happening so we can make a plan. Or she could have just devised a plan and sent people out to tell the Jews what was going to happen and so that she could get them to safety somehow. Although she did not hold power in the court like the king did, she most definitely had some resources at her disposal. Certainly she could have done something. She had tools in her hands, but Esther knew those were not the weapons weapons that God's people fight with. She knew that our weapons actually come from above. And so, in Esther chapter 4, we see the new queen is nervous. Actually, I would say she's terrified. She's terrified to go before the king to ask her people to be spared. She knows she has to do something. She knows the hour is late and that action is required But she's terrified. I mean, you know what happened to the last queen who ticked off the king. She was just disposed of. And we act exactly like that. We know that action is required. We know that the hour is late. But we're terrified. I mean, you saw what they did to Christians over there. You saw how they treated people who love God over here. You saw how people lost their careers or in some countries their lives for proclaiming Jesus. You saw how people lose friends and family members and are ostracized because they decide to take a stand for Christ. Yes, I did, friends. It's called a life laid down. It's called being willing to give it all up for Jesus. And so after sending word to her cousin Mordecai, that she is absolutely terrified. And she's not quite sure what to do. She's going to try something, but she's not sure if it's going to work. Her cousin responds like this. And I think it's a word for us today as well. It's Esther chapter 4, verse 13. It says, he sent back an answer, meaning Mordecai sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Church, do not think for a moment that because your life is comfortable for now, that if God is asking you to do something and you choose not to do it, that you will somehow escape the hardship. That you're somehow going to break, like get out free. It's not a get out of jail free card. But the same applies to us. If we remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for God's people will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And then he says this. And who knows? Who knows, church? Who knows but that you have come to your royal position For such a time as this. Friends, the hour's late. And I can confidently tell you, I have no clue what is in store. But I know that you were appointed 
by God for this exact point in history. I love chatting with my mom. She's a gift to me. I love chatting with her about all that is happening in the world because we always come to this one conclusion. No matter what's going on, we chat for hours about it and we come to this one conclusion. And the conclusion is always, what an honor that God would place us here at this point in history where all of scripture seems to be colliding together and he's asking me to serve him here. He, for some reason, trusts us to carry the greatest gift the world has ever seen in the midst of this trying time. It's not by mistake. It's not by chance that you're here in this season in this church, in this place, even here this morning, listening to this message. It's not by mistake. It's nerve-wracking, all that's going on. It's nerve-wracking what God might be asking you to do. In fact, it's terrifying when you think about it. But it's not a mistake. And I know the lives that we live, especially today as believers, can be difficult. The burden that we have to carry gets heavy. The load seems great. And so in this day, it is all the more reason to just lay it down. To live a life laid down. And so we see Esther reply, In the midst of being terrified for her life, it says Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. I find it fascinating in this story of Esther that this new Jewish queen in a foreign land, when she has no clue what to do, she responds the exact opposite of how we all would respond. Often, When we don't know what to do, what do we do? We begin to gather every resource we can think of. Well, I'm just going to bring this just in case I need it. I'm just going to save some money over here just in case. You never know. I'm just going to pull this option and that option. I'm going to call this person and just double check with that over there. Esther does the exact opposite. She says, I'm terrified. If I actually have to do what I think God is calling me to do, I might be killed. If she goes to the king unannounced. But instead of pulling out every contingency plan she can think of, she gives up everything she can think of. Instead of amassing everything she thinks she can control, she relinquishes control of even her most basic needs. And she calls a fast. In fact, she asks all the Jewish people in that region to fast and pray for three days. Talk about a life laid down. It was in obedience that Esther, an exiled Jew in the Persian Empire, presented herself to the court of the king and now was elevated to such a high position. It was in her obedience, despite her fear, that Esther resolves to visit the king unannounced. It's in her obedience because of her life laid down. She calls a fast of all the people of God to seek him for the deliverance of his people. And in the end... If for some reason all of this fails, if for some reason Esther maybe didn't hear God correctly, if for some reason he decides not to keep her, she says, if I perish, I perish. But but I'm going to do it in obedience. Talk about a life laid down. The last thing she could do, the last things she had control of, she gave up. She called a fast of all the people of God. 
And you know, fasting, it's like a secret weapon of our faith. It removes from our lives distraction. It increases self-control, and it puts all of our earthly physical indulgences in their rightful place, which is below Jesus, not above. Fasting reminds the kingdom of this world and its ruler that you would rather have Jesus than literally anything else, that you actually trust the giver more than the gifts, that you want the provider more than any provision he could give you. And fasting was customary in those days. It was commonplace that when the Jews needed something, when they wanted to seek God for something, when they weren't sure what to do, when they were terrified, they would give up their most basic needs so that they could seek God instead. They would remind both their spirits and their physical bodies where their real help came from. And it wasn't from any sustenance of this world. It wasn't from anything that this world could offer. Not even the food that they eat could help them. They needed God. And so they would fast from food and instead they would feast on the presence of God who is for them their real provider. It was customary for people in those days to fast as they sought God. All throughout scripture, we see examples of fasting for a multitude of different reasons. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before beginning his earthly ministry. In the book of Acts, the people of God, when they needed to make a great decision, they fasted before appointing leadership. Nehemiah fasted when he was in mourning. Ezra fasted, seeking deliverance and protection. In the book of Jonah, we see the people of Nineveh fasting out of grief and repentance. In the book of Judges, when people needed clarity or to gain a great victory, they fasted. In Luke chapter 2, we see Anna fasting just to worship and in prayer and in dedication to God all throughout Scripture. People fast for all different reasons. But I think the primary reason can be boiled down to this one thing. We fast in order that we might seek God above all other things. That we would seek God in the midst of confusion or when we need an answer. We fast when we want to seek God in the midst of grief and repentance. We fast when we're seeking God for deliverance or when we want to just worship him and pray. You see, fasting is about rightly prioritizing, or for many of us in this room today, about reprioritizing our life. Fasting is a life laid down. Fasting is saying, God, even before my most basic needs, I need you. So I'm going to lay down my most basic needs in order that I might find you and hear you, and see you at work in my life. And so friends, the hour is late. Perhaps for the first time in our generation, we feel the pressure of being called the people of God in the midst of a kingdom that hates him. And so my ask to you is simple. And it's similar to that of Esther. Over the next two weeks, as we go through this series, would you join me in fasting? From tomorrow, January 15th until January 28th, the last Sunday of our series, it's 14 days. Would you join me in fasting? But I want you to fast with intention. What are you seeking God for? Where do you need to see him move? I'm sick of people doing spiritual disciplines just for the sake of doing a spiritual discipline and not out of devotion to God. We don't fast for the sake of fasting or out of routine or obligation, but we do it to seek God, to give up everything else so that that we can see him and know him and put him in his rightful place above all other things so that we'll see changes in our behavior and in our spirits. So would you join me? On each of your chairs, there was a slip of paper. I'm going to invite the worship team up and the prayer team. And as they come up and as I pray, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Or maybe something immediately came to mind. What are you seeking God for in this season? 
As was on the slide, I think, just a moment ago, people see God for all different kinds of things. We see God to strengthen our prayers, for guidance, for wisdom, to express grief. We seek him for deliverance and protection. We seek him in repentance, in humility, because we have a concern. We seek him so that he would minister to other people. We seek him if we want to overcome temptation. We seek him just in worship and prayer. We seek him to prepare us for ministry. We fast to gain victory. What are you seeking God for? And then once you fill that part out, what are you seeking God? That part's probably easier. Then I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want me to fast in these next two weeks? And I'm just going to say, the biblical precedent of fasting means fasting food. That's the biblical precedent that we've been given. Sometimes in the book of Corinthians, couples who are married, when they're very serious about seeking God for something, they'll fast having sex until they get the answer that they're looking for. But the majority of fasting in scripture is fasting food. So ask God, how can I do that in the next two weeks? Maybe he wants you to fast a whole day or a few days. Maybe for you, like, you can't do that, so it's skipping a meal. Maybe it's fasting for the whole two weeks somehow. I don't want you to think about it. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. And probably what he's going to tell you is going to be a bit uncomfortable for you. Write it down and be obedient. Because the great promise for us today is that when we seek him, we will find him. So write it down and be obedient. Would you stand with me? We're going to prepare for worship or stay sitting if you're still writing. It's up to you. I'm just going to pray and then we're going to worship. So when you're ready, you can stand. Father, thank you. Oh, whatever season we find ourselves in, God, you're with us. Thank you. Even as we were, we were reminded this morning, God, in both the battle and in the blessing, you're with us. So we, thank, we say thank you. Thank you, God. God, and we understand the urgency of the time that we live in. Even when we look at our own families, God, we see the urgency. We see the great need for you. So we come before you humbly this morning. You teach us what to do. You teach us what we need from you. And you teach us how to fast in these next two weeks. And then, Father, I ask you for boldness. That we would respond in obedience. That we would not reason our way out of what you're trying to do, but that we would be radically obedient. God, it will feel crazy, some of the things you're asking people to do. It'll look weird to other people, and that's fine, God. You are, this is an audience of one. We live for an audience of one, to honor you. So increase our faith where it needs to be increased, God. That we would trust you. If you're calling us to it, you're going to keep us. If we seek you, we're going to find you. If we knock and we keep on knocking, God, you're going to open If we keep on asking, God, that's what you ask us to do. Keep on asking. And above all that you could give us, God, we want you. We want to see you. We want to know you, God. Forgive us when we're not hungry for you. Forgive us for the things that we've put in place of you. That we feel like we're satisfied because we've replaced you. Forgive us, God. Oh God, we could worship you for all of eternity. One day we will. And we still won't have reached the end. You'd still be worthy of more. So the small lives that we have today, in comparison to eternity, God, we give them to you. Have your will, have your way. Thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name.